All right. So um, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Affordable for Whom and Online Community Summit on Community Control of Deeply Affordable Housing. Um, my name is Kenyon Farrow, and I am the now former co-executive director of Partners for Dignity and Rights, but uh, I am obviously still connected uh, to partners and the organization. Uh, there's a lot of love, and I'm really happy to be um, co-hosting um, um, tonight's uh, summit. Um, before I go into a, a formal uh, you know, introduction of tonight's program and to our first set of speakers, I would like to um, first turn it over to uh, our uh, interpretation team uh, who will uh, guide us through uh, how uh, interpretation will work uh, for this evening for folks who need uh, Spanish interpretation throughout. So I'll turn it over to Gladys uh, for that announcement. Thank you very much. So as you see on the screen, uh, you have the bilingual instructions on how to enable the simultaneous interpretation. So please just um, look in your control the, for the globe interpretation and just um, select the language of your preference. English and if um, you would like to have the original audio muted, just click on mute original audio. I'm going to say the instructions in Spanish. Bienvenidos, esta sesión también va a tener interpretación al español. Welcome, the session is going to have English-Spanish interpretation. Están las instrucciones en la pantalla. We have the instructions on the screen. Puede usted seleccionar el botón interpretación que aparece en el panel de control. Icon on your strip. Seleccionar español. And choose Spanish. Si desea silenciar el audio original, también puede hacer. If you want to choose or mute the original audio, you can mute the original audio so you don't have interference. Great, thank you. Um, so to open us up tonight, um, just to give a little bit of background for folks who are perhaps new uh, to the conversation and joining us for the first time, in August 2019, over 200 activists from around the country came to New York City and spent two days sharing, discussing, and planning how community-controlled housing could, um, could become more affordable to extremely low-income households and those incomes below 30% of area median income. The conference was uh, called Affordable for Whom and was hosted by Partners for Dignity and Rights at that time known as NESRI. Uh, we rebranded uh, last year and uh, also co-hosted by the Right to the City, uh, to, uh, by Right to the City, the New Economy Project, and the New York City Community Land Initiative. The gathering was a huge success, though uh, more community organizers attended than community housing developers. So in short, there was not a deep dive into the housing finance challenges that keep deeply affordable housing from being developed. Our report at Partners, uh, Creating Community-Controlled, Deeply Affordable Housing, a resource toolkit for community activists and allied community-based housing developers is that deep dive. Co-authored by Zach Murray and Peter Sabonis, the report lays out the case for deeply affordable housing and explains in simple language the housing development process uh, and examines six community land trust projects that developed deeply affordable projects. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 10 projects in all uh, that reach that deep affordability. Tonight's program will, and this is a, a shot, I think, of, of some of the, um, of the report on the last slide. I think we'll drop a link to that in the, in the chat for folks who haven't uh, gotten it through email. Um, but uh, tonight's program will involve a short presentation of the report by Peter and Zach, then followed by a panel discussion of uh, four of the community housing providers featured in the report. And then we'll uh, turn to some breakout sessions with these providers uh, where sharing can occur. And uh, for attendees, you will get the opportunity to pick which breakout session uh, you want to attend. Um, and as I mentioned um, you know, earlier, the interpretation tonight is being uh, provided by uh, ENES or NS uh, translations. Uh, during our breakout sessions, we will maintain this room, the main room, where simultaneous interpretation will occur. 
in the two breakout rooms, uh, consecutive uh, interpretation will occur. Uh, but before I turn uh, the rest of the, or this next part of the program over to the co-authors of the report, uh, Zach and Peter, uh, let me give you uh, their bios. Um, so Zach Murray uh, leads the Up South Down South community development uh, uh, consulting practice that provides capacity building, leadership development, and technical assistance for new and emerging community land trust efforts. Previously, Zach was a program manager with the Oakland Community Land Trust, where he worked to promote resident-centered solutions, community ownership, and permit affordability through policy advocacy, technical assistance, and fundraising. Uh, Zach is a graduate uh, and uh, local policy specialist with ground, uh, I'm sorry, Zach uh, was a state and local policy specialist with the Ground and Solutions Network, a graduate of Cornell University. Uh, Zach's passion for community development and justice using race and place as a lens is inspired by his upbringing in Baltimore, Maryland. And Peter Sabonis uh, works at Partners for Dignity and Rights with community groups to promote human rights-based economic and community development. He brings together years of community organizing, uh, familiarity with skills related to law and public policy. He is a member of the Community Land Trust in Baltimore and was part of Baltimore Housing Roundtable's successful effort to prioritize community land trust through the city's affordable housing um, Trust Fund. He's a formal legal aid lawyer with an economics and legislative policy background. So I will turn it over to Peter and Zach. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kenyon. Um, I'm, I'm gonna lay out a project roadmap, a report roadmap um, briefly, and then I'll turn it over to Zach. Um, but this report, um, we'll put a link in the, uh, in the chat in a, in a minute. Um, but it lays out the case for extremely low income housing, that is for housing, the, that sector that is 30% uh, of area median income and below, all the way down to zero. We make the case for that, the argument for it. Um, it's not a hard argument to make. It's a sector that needs uh, affordable housing more than any other sector. We make the case for community controlled housing which we define in this report as rental, co-op housing, and home ownership housing on community-owned land, um, the most common model being community land trusts. That is land owned by the community that's held in trust for it and is permanently affordable. It's again, an easy case to make uh, because the experience shows that uh, this model provides permanent affordability and uh, security of tenure. That is some guard against displacement because of market forces. We go through the challenges we face uh, in doing this, which can be summed up as um, trying to push transformative models um, in structures that are not yet transformed. We get into some of the housing development basics uh, from a finance point of view, um, which explains why there's so little ELI uh, or deeply affordable housing. The short answer there is not enough public money. And we provide some resources to help with uh, that challenge um, and also highlight where communities have mobilized and uh, have created new public supports. Um, that augment those resources. We get into the CLT case studies. Um, Zach will, will highlight those. Uh, we have some policy recommendations, of course, um, foremost of which is the transfer of, of public property, publicly owned property to black and person of color communities and uh, public banking linking operating money to uh, uh, capital development money. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute and uh, giving community controlled housing um, a priority in the housing voucher program. Um, that last piece um, that I mentioned highlights really the basics um, that we get into in this report, the basics of, of housing development finance. And I should say there are these, this housing development is complex, um, but essentially the finance piece involves three things, property acquisition and pre-development construction and rehabilitation of property. Sometimes you don't need to do that. 
um, but uh, often you do, uh, and operating the, uh, the community controlled housing or operating the housing over a term of 15, 20, 99 years. And what we do in this report basically is look at property acquisition and development, which is at site control, whether it's tenants trying to fight to get their own building um, or communities trying to acquire property, that cost of site control, that cost of property can be staggering, it can be cheap, or it can be somewhere in between. And um, it's just the first step of many. We put forth uh, a number of strategies that folks have used in acquiring property from organizing and mobilizing to creating uh, public policy options that didn't exist before, like small site funds. Not gonna get in each of these, um, you can check the report. Um, the second piece with construction and rehabilitation of housing really involves equity that's called cash, essentially, um, and uh, or cash that's called equity in the real estate lingo, and debt and loans. And uh, if you can do this without any debt, that is wonderful and you will be well on your way to having deeply affordable housing. Uh, but this is the usual mix. And we put forth some of the, uh, uh, the equity sources that are out there and have been used in the past and some of the, the debt sources uh, as well. Um, and then finally, where the rubber meets the road is in operating expenses, where you have to pay off the loans that you may have took in uh, step two um, and you have to maintain the housing, you have to repair it, you have to create reserves for emergencies, all while trying to cover those costs with low rents. And essentially, there are a number of strategies to do that that have been used so far. Vouchers are one, uh, direct operating assistance is another, and cross-subsidy is another, where the lower rents are subsidized by higher rental units or even subsidized by a higher rental commercial space. And we provide a table of operating subsidies, at least on the federal level, at the end of this report. So that's about it. We have, as I told you, there's policy recommendations. I'll turn it over to Zach, who will um, give you some sense of, uh, of the, the case studies and, and what we found. I'm going to give you an, a new slide on the um, on that, Zach. Great. great. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, such a great attendance. It's really great to see everyone. Um, uh, so as Peter mentioned, I just wanted to briefly discuss um, the development finance fund, uh, findings. We were able to talk to um, five CLTs and received um, 10 community controlled developments as an example. And um, we, across those um, CLTs, uh, had a total of 288 residential units. Um, 57 of those units in five developments were preservation and 231 of the units in five were new construction, um, representing a total development cost across all 10 of 79.5 million. Um, and an average total development cost per unit across these markets and CLTs of $276,000 per unit. Uh, we also uh, recorded an average annual operating costs across these 10 developments of $8,000 um, per unit. And uh, finally, across the 288 units, 67% or 192 of them, um, two thirds of the units were affordable to folks at or below 30% AMI. Um, and so just we wanted to just highlight for you all one example um, of the CLT development findings. Um, and this one comes from the San Francisco Community Land Trust. It's Columbus United it is um, a great example because it represents um, the complexity in terms of getting these types of deals done. Um, a lot of that complexity is political, um, having to push against housing departments, city governments that are not oriented to um, community land trusts or cooperatives in part because they are leveraging the predominant funding source, the low-income housing tax credit, that oftentimes doesn't apply to these deals. And so um, in the case of Columbus United, there was an extreme amount of work politically that had to be done to, um, to change rules um, within the housing department um, to ensure that um, a cooperative um, that included commercial space for community-serving law practice um, could basically take place. 
And so um, this funding pie, um, in a sense, spells out that complexity um, and, and the types of policies that um, the, the San Francisco Community Land Trust had to leverage in order to make this deal work. Um, they brought in um, leverage in part from the Asian Law Caucus, which um, was able to put down some capital um, to ensure uh, both their presence in the commercial space, but also that the burden on the folks in the co-op um, was reduced. And so um, the predominant fund funding for this comes, of course, from local government um, through a combination of different programs, including a seismic retrofit loan program that is forgivable um, upon the execution of 55 years of affordability, um, including a new, entirely new program that was invented to specifically support um, the tenants at uh, the Columbus United Space called the Real Ownership for Tenants, where the city allocated remaining funds um, specifically attuned to the needs here. Um, as well as, again, the Asian Law Caucus, um, the residents who were able to raise um, $210,000 through their co-op equity stakes, um, their, their share purchases, um, as well as a combination of resources from um, various sources, including the San Francisco, uh, San Francisco Community Land Trust contribution and the Federal Home Loan, and the Federal Home Loan Bank. Um, and so, uh, again, just spelling it out here, this was an acquisition uh, deal that also involved some um, rehab. Um, and a lot of the rehabilitation funds came from the city, um, you know, in part because of the availability of seismic retrofit for older buildings in San Francisco, um, and ultimately involved 21 units um, at a cost of 260,000, uh, 261,000 roughly per resident. And um, most of the current residents are ELI, although the units are affordable up to 40% AMI. Um, and so just to share um, a few um, concluding thoughts um, with you all from what we found um, and observations from what we found in talking with these um, the community land trusts are that the CLTs are successfully utilizing a diversity of funding and development tactics. This is in part by necessity. Um, most CLTs are not able um, to access the, community, the uh, low income housing tax credits. And so it really requires a lot of creative work um, to fundraise, to motivate local city governments um, and municipal governments um, to make the investment, uh, to see the worthiness of the model. And a lot of work is being done also to empower tenants um, to fundraise, to, um, to bring in their leverage politically um, to help transform the funding landscape um, of what's available um, locally in communities. Um, the next point is that um, in a sense, we found that CLTs offer more simplicity um, in finance. Um, although there are complications in being able to get the money, oftentimes the methods that the CLTs are utilizing are a lot less complicated um, than the low-income housing tax credit um, programs and the developments that are pursued. Um, and we think that this is something that local governments um, can continue to push for in addition to um, leveraging the low-income housing tax credit, that local investments are utilized to help support CLTs to make a deepened impact in these communities. Um, Additionally, uh, CLTs in many communities are helping to democratize capital, um, including local subsidy um, and private funding. What we found is that um, oftentimes, because this is a political uh, effort that uh, is, is you know, happening in part in communities because of the presence of displacement, um, that communities are helping housing departments to open their books, um, to be more transparent in how subsidy works and in how communities can get access because these programs are, again, less complicated and require less hoops necessarily than the, the low-income housing tax credit, they are in a sense more accessible. Um, and so there's great possibility that um, communities have more democratic access to local resources um, to buy down affordability and to preserve and build uh, more affordable housing for those who need it the most. And finally, um, CLTs, are encountering challenges, um, mainly in terms of converting to ownership. Um, the possibilities for this include rising housing costs in the markets, as well as a lack of funding priority for permanently affordable housing. And so in some cases, um, there's money to preserve, to do the acquisition rehab of buildings, but um, not the same type of resource um, at the local or state level to actually convert these buildings to um, to permanent um, affordability in the short term. And so more work can be done to see um, the value of tenants and, and residents being able to build equity, um, the efficiency that the CLTs provide in, in being able to do that. 
Um, and so that's uh, what we found. And now um, we're honored to turn it over to um, the panel portion of this conversation and are thrilled to be joined by um, four folks from the field in CLTs across the country. Um, who are gonna share in a question and answer um, some about their um, experience in this work. Um, and so just give me one moment to pull up our questions. Yeah, I'll do the introductions while you look for your questions, Zach, uh, just so folks know who will be joining us. Um, and I should say too, for our folks attending, um, throughout this portion, if you have questions or comments, feel free to use the chat and then, you know, Zach may refer back to those in the Q&A with the panelists. Um, so, uh, so feel free to, to use that function. Um, so uh, first panelist uh, will be uh, Athena Bernkoff. Uh, who is a cross-pollinator flexing at the intersections of Black and queer liberation, land, and uh, land housing, and healing justice. Brooklyn born and bred, they have worked as a facilitator and organizer across New York City in roles uh, such as Cop Watch and uh, community safety trainer with Harlem Cop Watch, uh, tenant rights and anti-displacement advocate at Legal Aid Society, core member of the Audre Lorde Project's Third Space Wellness Collective, and currently a project director at the East Harlem El Barrio Community Land Trust. Athena is committed to co-creating urban communities whose foundations are rooted in mutual care, collective stewardship of resources, and being in right relationship with land. Our second panelist will be uh, Nora uh, Liktash, uh, who has worked with the Women's Community Revitalization Project uh, a multiracial community development organization committed to social and economic equity for low-income women and their families since its founding in 1987. Uh, she is Philadelphia-based, she's the Philadelphia-based uh, organization's executive director. Uh, third panelist will be Michael Monty, uh, who is the Champlain, who is the Champlain Housing Trust Chief Executive Officer, having joined the leadership team in December 2007 and was appointed to CEO in uh, January of this year, 2021. He has over 40 years of community and economic development experience at both the nonprofit and municipal level. Michael is also a founder and partner of uh, the independent community development consult, uh, consulting group, Burlington Associates, where he worked with community land trusts across the country. And last but not least is Steve King, uh, who is the executive director of the Oakland Community Land Trust in Oakland, California. He spent the last 20 years working for community-based organizations in Oakland in the areas of equitable development, resident-controlled housing, and applied social research. Uh, Steve previously served as the Housing and Economic Development Coordinator of Urban Strategies Council, where he led the organization's multi-year investigation into the impacts of the foreclosure crisis on the flatland neighborhoods of Oakland. His work culminated in the report, Who Owns Your Neighborhood? The Role of Investors in Post Foreclosure Oakland, one of the first published uh, works on the influx of speculative investment capital into single family rentals. Steve also contributed a chapter to the recently released book on Common Ground, International Perspectives on Community Land Trust, published by Terra Nostra Press and the Center for Community Land Trust Innovation. So uh, welcome to the panel and I'll turn it over to uh, Zach. Great, thank you, Kenyon. Um, and so to begin with Athena, um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, the East Harlem El Barrio CLT obtained four multifamily buildings from New York City that also contain commercial and community space. Um, the CLT will turn the sites into 38 residential housing units and three community spaces. This has come years after after years of organizing and planning. What moved the CLT and the city to action on this property? And um, what have you overcome and what challenges still remain? Thanks, Zach, and hello to all. Grateful to be invited to speak here and be amongst um, such incredible organizers and, um, and folks in the CLT and land justice world. Um, so much. Uh, so many variables to this question, and so I'll do my best to um, get to as many points as I can within um, the time frame and leave uh, time for other folks to speak. But um, it's always necessary to shout out Picture the Homeless, a grassroots group um, created uh, for and by uh, folks who have experienced homelessness, who 
um, in the early 2010s did the incredible uh, work of crying out the disparity between the rates of homelessness in New York City and the amount of vacant property throughout the city. Um, and so they engage in a huge uh, survey of big chunks of the city to identify the amount of vacant property that was left throughout the city um, and really called attention in particular to some of the city owned property that had been left to um, in neglect uh, over years of really um, exploitative or just neglectful city policy. Um, so there's many elements to the organizing that happened um, around uh, building towards CLTs um, at that time, but it's crucial to note that um, at one point, the city was the biggest landlord in New York um, and had amassed an incredible amount of properties that a lot um, of which came into city ownership through tax foreclosures. And over the decades, um, especially after so-called urban renewal um, and communities that have been left to essentially rot um, and specifically black and brown communities that have been left of their, to their own devices um, and excluded from urban renewal policies very actively, uh, a lot of those became city owned properties that, that deteriorated over decades. And so picture the homeless in the early organizing looked to city property as potentially the low hanging fruit. But first in um, the kind of poor conditions that these buildings were in um, and the need, the desperate need for attention to the folks who lived in those buildings and also in the face of changing city policy um, at the time. Um, uh, a lot of those buildings were in a specific program called tenant interim lease, which was supposed to be in, you know, very brief, a pathway to ownership for um, residents for so, uh, who lived in some of those buildings. And, you know, decades later, uh, that program in and of itself was created through the organizing, the grassroots organizing of um, the residents who lived in these disinvested communities. Um, and then after the program had been created by the city, um, were left without the outcome, the promises that the city had made essentially within the program, that repairs would be made, that they would be given training, and then later would be um, given opportunities to own some of this housing. And so after being left um, in terrible conditions, many folks for 20, 30 years, um, the city decided to phase out that program. Uh, and created a new program that was supposed to focus on uh, cooperative housing uh, uh, structures, um, but left the future of these buildings in what was called the TIL program um, in the balance and in a lot of uncertainty. And so picture the homeless organizers really rallied around these buildings saying, all right, we know these buildings are going to come out of this particular program. Some of them will be put into another program, another city-based program, looking again at a different form of cooperative ownership, training repairs, while others were very likely be put onto the pathway of private ownership. Um, and we know oftentimes the outcomes of that, of city owned property being sold to private owners, will flip it, um, we'll see radical increases in the rents um, and likely, potentially unlikely the displacement of the residents in them who have nowhere else to go, um, especially in the context of East Harlem being one of the last few affordable neighborhoods in the city. And so, we were able to, um, uh, through the results of the survey that Picture the Homeless did called Banking on Vacancy, I believe that came out in 2012, um, put a lot of pressure on the city to call attention to uh, the neglect that these residents had experienced doing things like um, getting elected officials into um, examining community land trusts as a, a viable model for structuring those, um, taking um, staff from city agencies, the city's housing and preservation department on a walking tour of the building so they could see face to face the poor quality of the housing that the city owned um, and needed to, to reckon with kind of the deterioration, the neglect that the city had left these buildings in. Um, which led to, after many negotiations, um, the city identifying a particular set of three of the properties that are now in the project um, from a list of these city owned properties. And then a fourth building was actually um, added to the mix chosen by the city. And so one thing to know is that the city actually had a lot of power in making the final decision as to which 
uh, of the properties entered into the, um, what is now the four buildings in the East Harlem Barrio project. But of course, none of that would have happened at all without the incredible organizing a picture of the homeless members and allies who really forced the city to say, to, to reckon with the, the, the hit, their history of neglecting these properties and the need to take action um, that wouldn't just reproduce these conditions in some other similar dynamic. In terms of challenges, we were able to acquire these properties at a dollar piece um, from the city, but they're all in various states of disrepair, which requires significant rehabilitation, which of course comes with high price tag. Um, and so we had to examine our financing options, most of which a big chunk is coming from the city, but another chunk is coming from a private um, finance, uh, lender, which then forced us to be in the difficult position of choosing um, you know, between improving the conditions in the building and reaching our affordability goals. And while we were able to achieve the, the, the incredible milestone of protecting the affordability at just under half of the units in the project, as well as setting aside four units specifically um, for folks who are coming out of the city shelter system, we also know that um, some of the buildings are going, some of the units are going to be unaffordable to um, residents of the neighborhood uh, where we operate East Harlem. And so that's one of the challenges that we continue to reckon with of how do we secure additional funding to deepen the affordability of those units while also continue to organize um, with other groups around the city to prevent this similar uh, situation from recreating for other CLTs who are in the process of looking at city owned property um, which, and who will likely be left with some of these um, similar types of properties that have been neglected and which will need significant rehab. So I'll leave it there and hopefully um, we'll be able to speak to other folks about other uh, elements of our project. Great, thank you very much. And um, just so that folks know, uh, Athena will be leading um, a breakout session for those who want to explore um, city property acquisition and issues related to it. Um, and so for folks who are interested, you can remain in the main room when we go to the breakout um, session portion of the agenda. Um, next, we'll turn to Nora. Um, thank you, Nora, for joining us. Um, in the report, we featured two case studies where um, the Women's Community Revitalization Project used federal low-income housing tax credit, LIHTC, subsidies to create affordable rental townhomes. In one, uh, the Nicole Hines townhomes, you will create a community land trust and tenants will have the opportunity to buy the homes. What's the plan to do this and how might other LIHTC housing providers move in this direction? If time, unlike most, in time, uh, unlike most LIHTC um, finance developers, all of your LIHTC project units are affordable to those under 30% AMI. How were you able to do that um, when most are not able to do that? Um, sure. So um, we're working on a few lease purchase developments now. And we're using what people have called the low-income housing tax credits and some fancy folks call it LIHTC. But really what it is, is that that funding source, although it's complicated, pays for 70% of the costs for us to develop a home. So it's worth it for us in terms of using it for affordability. And I wanna answer the questions about how we get from tenants to homeowners. But first, I just wanna say the organization I work for and the leaders really value rental housing first as a priority because there's just not enough deeply affordable rental housing in Philly and every day we're losing it. So um, we, in Philadelphia, people think of rent as a four letter word. They act as if homeowners are better than renters, especially the elected officials. So there's times when we have done lease purchase because we had to do lease purchase even though our preference is to do permanently affordable deep rental, deeply affordable rental housing. And so, in the development that um, the first lease purchase development we did, we did it, um, we finished construction and families moved in in 2016. It's 36 homes. And in the low income housing tax credit projects, you need to keep rents affordable for 15 years. So in, in year eight, after families moved in, we're gonna start doing home ownership counseling to support families to look at their credit and can they get rid of any credit problems and can they get themselves in the position to get a mortgage. And then by year 15, this is a long process, um, ideally they'll be able to, if they want to buy the houses. We, we put money in as soon as we built these houses to make sure that there was money for closing costs 
we'll sell them for 75,000. And right now houses across the street are selling for 350. So that's the plan. It's not that complicated. And that's what we're doing. Um, in terms of the second part of your question is how do we keep things truly affordable to people, deep affordability. To, in Philly, 30% of area median income is about 26,000 for a family of four. And so the way we do it was just discussed already. We apply for every single pot of money that we can apply for that's free money, what Peter called cash, money we don't have to pay back. So that's one way we do it. And the second way we do it is that we reinvest what's called a developer's fee. So anyone who's developing housing in their budget, there's money set aside for lawyers, architects, for construction workers, for bricks. There's also money in there for a developer's fee. And most developers use it to pay themselves back because it took some time to put together the financing, to get it built, to, uh, to select tenants, move your tenants in. But instead, we use most of this money and we figured out, all of us together, none of us knew how to do investments. We learned how to do investments. So over 35 years, we've invested $4 million. We try not to touch the principal, just the interest, and the interest lowers the rent. The end. Great. And um, thank you so much. Um, Athena, I'm sorry, Nora will be joining Athena in the session about city property acquisition in this main room. Um, and thank you so much, Nora, for your brevity. We have just a few minutes left. Um, and so I want to make sure we can get um, to all the speakers um, before we break out. So um, I'm going to turn now to Michael. Um, and thank you again for joining us, Michael. Since the beginning of COVID, um, the Champlain Housing Trust has engaged in a number of projects where hotels and motels were converted into permanent housing for people facing homelessness. We um, included a case study of Susan's Place in the report, which was done with the Federal CARES Act money and no debt. Um, you were able to secure housing vouchers to cover operating costs. How were you able to pull this off and what relationships, history, dynamics enabled this to happen? I was first, thank you very much. And let me just say Champlain Housing Trust has been around for about 37 years. And so I think one of the ways that reasons why we were able to pull it off is because we have a history of doing real estate. Um, on behalf of the community and the people. So there's a little bit of um, uh, knowledge and, and understanding of the community and, and, the, fo and the folks that are around us. Uh, let me just also reflect that we do a lot of light tech projects. We have home ownership, we have co-ops, we have light tech projects. Everything we do is permanently affordable. All of our light tech projects are permanently affordable. They will never turn into, they will become ours permanently in the year 15. And we own lots of our rental housing as a result of that. But we bring all of that sort of like capacity and experience to sort of this particular uh, deal. Prior to the purchase of this particular property, we had owned three other motels. We started in 2013 with simply saying, you know, the state is putting a lot of people in welfare motels. We think we could do something better and easier than that. Um, we think we could do it cheaper. And we think we could do it in a way that's more humane and has better results for folks. So we bought our first one in 2013, we bought two more, and we did conversions of those, one for very folks who were chronically homeless, uh, with, uh, and they all have services, another smaller one actually with uh, our local hospital for folks who had no place to go and needed to leave the hospital program. Now this one in particular, as soon as the pandemic started, we started advocating for Sierra funds for housing homeless folks. This is one of three, two others, there are three altogether. This one was simply that we had early on made a statement to the legislature and to the governor, you need to take your CRF funding funds and use it to create permanent affordable housing. Uh, we went out, we have a broker who we work with, we made it, uh, we, we found three different motels, we bought two right away, one was for domestic violence shelter, which needed a better place to sort of house its folks during the pandemic. This one was a simple and straightforward uh, we paid the owner the price. They were suite uh, motels, meaning they had 600 to 800 square feet fully furnished, one or two bedrooms. One bedroom usually we created a couple of two bedrooms. And with as little money as possible, we have them and we're housing 68 uh, homeless folks there now, formerly homeless folks. Uh, all have vouchers. We have someone who is paid for uh, to be there to support, provide food and other resources for the folks who are there. So for us, 
it's simply being out front and being kind of bold about what we think should happen, stating what we think should happen and going to the funders and saying, uh, you have a crisis, a humanitarian crisis in terms of folks who are homeless and need to be housed. And we think we can continue to do this. And so we did three more. We're about to do two more uh, with ARPA funds. Uh, so we'll have purchased our eighth motel uh, hotel by the end of the, uh, the month. So uh, these are pretty, uh, from a transaction point of view, pretty straightforward from a real estate point of view, uh, not that very complicated. And uh, given the amount of time we have, I'll be glad to sp um, spend a lot more time in the more workshop to go through the details of how we actually did it. So. Great. And thank you, Mike, Michael. And what Michael is referencing is that he will um, join folks in break, breakout room one to explore in more detail the hotel motel conversions. Um, next, we'll turn to Steve. Um, Steve, in, um, in our report, OCLT was used in three case studies, each using different approaches. Um, two involved properties and tenants at risk of displacement, and one involved housing creation for families facing homelessness. In the housing preservation cases, what was the bridge to the tenants? And um, Oak CLT was also quite creative in meeting the cost of property acquisition and operating in all three cases. Would you share how you did it? Hey, Zach. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'll take a stab at these questions. Um, in, in terms of the housing preservation work, really all of the, effectively all of the work that Oakland Community Land Trust has done over our 12 year history has been preservation, really focusing on the existing housing stock in Oakland. Um, originally uh, vacant foreclosed homes because that was the context in which our organization was created. But now over the past five or six years, really focusing on properties where tenants are uh, at risk of displacement as a result of largely market activity of speculation. Um, and so in the, the projects uh, featured in the report, um, that was really the, um, the bridge to the tenants was um, moments of crisis where in Oakland, uh, as is the case in, in other hot market cities, um, often a, a transfer or sale of a property portends some level of instability for, for folks that in Oakland, you know, a, a new speculative investor will often use a whole range of tactics to push out long-term tenants um, in search of higher rents. And this happens particularly in neighborhoods where there has been uh, decades of disinvestment in Oakland, the predominantly black and Latinx neighborhoods um, and investors, speculators see kind of this untapped uh, value in purchasing those properties and kicking out, um, kicking out folks despite Oakland having um, rather robust just cause eviction protections and other, other protections in place that that market, those market pressures still are displacing people. Um, and so in these instances that, um, that are in the report, uh, Oak CLT has effectively kind of positioned the, the CLT in a way that we can, uh, or at least we try to be a resource to uh, residents when they find themselves in these scenarios. Um, and that, that was the case in each of these instances where um, a building was going up for sale, uh, tenants uh, were scrambling to um, create some sort of path forward where, where they could um, create some stability. And um, in terms of our process, we you know, meet with residents on, on multiple occasions and map out or just see if there's a shared vision for um, a plan for acquisition and eventual transition to resident controlled housing on community owned land through the land trust. And if we can agree upon kind of a, a set of, of, of values and a path forward, that's really where um, Oak CLT has uh, been able to uh, and chosen to devote our limited capacity as a community land trust. Um, and in terms of the financing, um, you know, it's everything we've done has really been out of necessity because there is not yet, there's not yet a system in place to do this kind of small site um, preservation, occupied preservation work that is geared towards the creation of community ownership, whether it's through um, 
uh, single family ownership and, and that we do um, in the CLT or multi-unit projects where we're looking to create cooperative ownership on CLT land. Um, so we've really tried to be creative um, just out of necessity in terms of um, pulling together multiple sources of financing, including crowdfunding, crowd investment strategies of um, pooling loan capital from community members into, into an investment um, mechanism and um, just really creating creating something um, to solve our, our problems until we create that larger ecosystem to fund this work at, at larger scale. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and we can talk more in, in our, the breakout session. Great, thank you, Steve. And um, Steve is referencing breakout room two where he will discuss in further detail um, partnering with tenants at risk of displacement and creative financing. Um, I noticed just one question in the chat um, from John um, and it was regarding um, the comment in the concluding observations uh, from the report around the difficulty of conversion to ownership. And he just wanted to know what we were referencing. And we were referencing the conversion of units from rental to um, CLT tenant ownership and some of the challenges there and, and limited funding there to make that happen. Um, and seeing as though there are no other questions, I'm going to turn it back at this point um, to Kenyon, who's gonna help give us a description um, and instructions on the breakout rooms. And thank you all again on the panelists for joining us this evening. Thank you, Zach. So um, at this point, you all have heard, um, you know, some details from uh, the report from Partners for the Immediate Rights and then some presenters uh, who are folks who have, uh, you know, been working and developing community land trusts around the country. And so um, we're gonna go into these um, three breakout rooms um, and so I'll give you a description of each room. And I think the best way to approach it is there's, so for folks, there's one group that'll be the, the main room, which is this actual space. And so uh, if you wanna stay in this room, uh, maybe we should have you just drop the word main, M-A-I-N in the chat. And then there will be breakout room one and breakout room two. And so if you decide that you want to go into that breakout room, you know, either put one or the number two in the chat when you select. So I'll describe the rooms and then uh, we will start the process so that our um, tech folks can start to break us out. Um, so uh, number so in the in the main room, which will be this, this actual space, um, uh, Athena and Nora will host a discussion on uh, city property acquisition issues related to it and other CLT challenges you may be experiencing. Um, uh, there will be some uh, simultaneous interpretation also in this uh, space as well. Uh, and uh, Julia Durante Martinez of uh, LISC in the East Harlem uh, El Barrio CLT will support and facilitate uh, this discussion, uh, you know, to the extent necessary. So that'll be the main room. So if you want to be in this discussion about city property acquisition, um, drop the word main in the chat box. Um, but if you want to uh, be in uh, a discussion with Michael Monti, who will be hosting a discussion on the conversion of hotels and motels to permanent, deeply affordable housing. Um, that will be in room one. So if you're interested in uh, hotel and motel conversion, um, that'll be room one uh, with Michael Monti and uh, Peter Sabonis from Partners will uh, support and facilitate that discussion in room one. Uh, uh, oh, so, uh, okay, so Peter says this, you don't need to drop in the chat, people will select themselves. Okay, so um, room two, uh, Steve King will host a discussion on creative financing, working with tenants, uh, using commercial space to cross-subsidize deeply affordable residential units. Uh, there'll also be uh, consecutive interpretation in this room. Hillary Caldwell of the New York City Community Land Initiative will support and help facilitate that discussion. So that will be room two. So again, the three rooms are the main room, which will be uh, on city property acquisition. Room one will be uh, a hotel and motel conversion. And uh, the third room or room two 
uh, as we're calling the uh, using uh, commercial space to cross subsidize deeply affordable residential units. And um, I will turn it over to uh, whoever is going to be doing the actual uh, moving people into rooms uh, process at this point. So I'll go on mute. <laughs> That'll be Sarah. Hey folks, I've opened the room now. You should either get a pop-up or you should be able to click the breakout rooms button at the bottom of your screen. And then you can select which room you'd like to join. And again, if you would like to just uh, stay in the main room for the main session, you can uh, click nothing. And if you're confused and don't know how to do that, you can drop it in the chat and I will assign you manually. Yeah, Sarah, can you repeat that instruction? Because I see some people who don't see the don't see the buttons. I, I don't see them either in my chat. So, got it. Not a problem. Let me just assign folks manually. So everyone, this may take a minute or so since we're going to do this manually. Uh, so just be patient while uh, Sarah uh, gets our rooms populated. Folks, if you are still here and you were hoping to go to room two, please drop your name in the chat one more time. So there's a question uh, again for the topics in the room. So I'll repeat those. Uh, so here in the main room, so if you wanna be in the main room, uh, that conversation is on city property acquisition. Um, in room one will be uh, conversion of hotels and motels into uh, permanent affordable housing. 
and uh, room two will be uh, using commercial space to cross subsidize deeply affordable residential units. So those are the three options. Uh, again, main room, room one and room two. Appreciate your patience, everyone. If you're still in this room and you don't want to be, please drop your name in the chat. I am hopefully narrowing down here. And if you want to be in the main room, then you're here. So it sounds like Sarah's finishing up the last couple. So I would say, uh, Athena and Nora, you can take over. And if there's a couple people who will be moved to either room one or room two, we will. Sarah will manage that while you get started. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kenyon. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you for choosing to be here with Nora and I. Um, we would love to start out with folks. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Nora, I'm, I'm stealing your thunder, maybe. No, it's fine. We're asking folks <laughs> to please put in the chat your name, your pronouns, and where you're from, and what you're excited about or proud of or dreaming for in the future in the work that you're doing on permanent affordability and community control. And we're going to put these instructions in the chat also and come off the slide so we can see what you're saying. And we're especially interested in your dreams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, well, I'm attempting to to say I want to be in the main room. I guess I'm in there. You and are. I made it. I'm Mel Krantz, he, him, and I'm a member of the South Bay Community Land Trust as well as the uh, Santa, Santa Clara County uh, Affordable Housing Network. And I'm, I'm uh, very interested in, in uh, getting uh, our particular uh, organization and the whole, the whole uh, universe, if possible, into uh, a community kind of uh, home ownership or, or home rental situations so that this uh, ridiculous um, rent crisis and housing crisis and homeless crisis can be finally begin to resolve itself. Thanks, Robert. We're really, we hear you're excited about getting land and getting homes into home ownership in your CLT. We're really encouraging people to put what they're proud of or excited about into the chat, if you don't mind. That was great, Robert. Thanks for starting us off. I'm Milt. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were Robert Aguirre. Milt Aguirre. He is See. here, I know. Sorry, Milt. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? No? Yeah, go ahead. Speak up. Yeah, hi. My name is Anthony Williams. I'm... Uh, I uh, was born and raised in Baltimore, but I'm also co-founder of Picture the Homeless Organization uh, that started in New York. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, I'm very excited. I love the language. I always love the language of either takeover or buying property or land acquisition it always excites me in every form and every way. Um, I I'm, I'm, was born and raised in Baltimore. Um, I left here at 17, traveled the country, worked with a lot of organizations around housing and stuff like that, and homeless-led organizations as well. Uh, I'm back in Baltimore. I've been here since 2015, working on, um, you know, all, all types of work around the continuum of care, funding, services, programs, uh, Anything that has to do with uh, about this disinvestment that we have in Baltimore in our communities, like we have blocks and blocks of abandoned properties um, that's just, uh, you know, it's horrible. 
So people are excited about taking over CLTs for the universe. Do you see something else, Athena, you want to lift up? Yes, dreams of an affordable New York for everyone. Shout out to that. Um, this thank you, Michelle. Yeah, the harp money, harper money. So, so we, you know, so we're planning and planning and so you'll hear more about uh, what's going on here in Baltimore. We'll make sure we keep everybody posted. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anthony. I'm deeply honored um, to have you here and as a founder of PTH. So glad to meet you here in this virtual space. Um, other dreams we have here. Uh, we have Marie says, um, income, community-based income housing for all. Shout out to that. A city where everyone can feel safe. Louise says, wants housing out of the profit market. Mm -hmm. Lauren says, interest in using CLTs to create permanently affordable housing for homeless folks. So we feel like you're in the right breakout group because that's what we care about too. <laughs> um, I, I think you've already met me and Athena. I don't know, do you want to introduce yourself, yourself Athena again? Sure, thanks Nora. Um, so hi everyone again. I'm glad to be sharing space with everyone here. Uh, my name is Athena Bernkoff, my pronouns are they and them. I'm the project director at East Front of Barrio CLT. Um, Y'all got my bio, so I won't go uh, into that anymore. Um, but we'll say that um, uh, having been, you know, grown up in New York, it's it's really, and grown up in um, in the hood in New York, it's always been, uh, I've always had a difficult relationship to who owns the land, who gets to claim space, who gets to be safe on their block, in their street, even in their home. Um, and so one of my, uh, deepest dreams um, and one of the things I'm most proud of uh, at East Harlem Body was being in the deep conversation, the difficult conversation of what it means to um, be in community stewardship of our land, of our homes, um, knowing that uh, for many people that's, that's almost impossible to conceive because it's so outside of the boundaries of what they've experienced, um, either personally or even over generations in their family. Um, and it's hard to be in conversation, but it's one of the things that I'm also most proud to be doing. Yeah, I see a lot of people introducing themselves in relation to how gentrification is affecting their neighborhood, claiming their neighborhood, controlling our communities. And my name's Nora, I work in Philly, and I work for an organization that helped to create the Community Justice Land Trust 12 years ago. And I'm just so proud of being part of a group that used people power to win a parcel of city owned land in South Philly. It was the last city owned land in that neighborhood in South Philly and it's gentrifying really quick. So our job today is gonna be to re be talking about land and how, how do you get land and use some examples from our own experience. But we're also gonna be asking you, if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna get to a slide. Um, to be thinking about, oops, that's the wrong slide. Um, to be thinking, we just know everyone is coming from such different places with different kinds of experience in a different part of the process of winning land. And so we're asking folks, if you can, at some point in this session, and we'll focus more on it later, if you're from a group that's interested in affordability and community control, but you're just starting to think about getting land, that's one category or buildings. If you're part of a group that's identified land or buildings and you're, that your group wants to own, that's kind of the second category thought folks might be in. Or if you are part of a group that's been able to acquire land and buildings, some folks are there and have already gotten some and trying to figure out what next steps are, thinking about that. And then there might be folks who are part of organizations that don't quite fit any of the above. So a little bit later in our agenda, we're gonna ask you to figure out what group you feel like you're part of and to develop some questions. But I think we wanna get back to um, Athena. Is that right? Am I at the right spot, Athena? I think, uh, were you gonna go ahead and present now? I think you're oh, No, you're right. Thank you. Following the agenda, I can do that. 
Um, so what I'll do is go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see, oh, I don't know how we landed on this page. Can everyone see um, East Harlem Barrio Affordable for Home presentation? Okay, so with that, I will jump right into it. Ooh, it is not, there we go. Um, so actually, fortunately, one of the questions that um, uh, was asked on the panel helped me to get to part of the crucial history of East Harlem Barrio, which is our founding through the deep work and organizing a picture of the homeless. And so I don't necessarily want to repeat all of that, uh, but need to reinforce the importance of the, um, the survey that Picture of the Homeless did and the, the report that they issued banking on vacancy to really call out not just um, vacant property, but specifically the speculative real estate market in New York and how powerful it was both in the private sector, but also publicly and how those interact with each other. Um, and so in, as an outcome of that report, um, we saw a couple of things. One was um, something called the, the development of, uh, the development of NICELY, which stands for New York City Community Land Initiative, uh, which is a convening of social justice groups, organizers um, from across the city who were really focused on um, uh, creating affordable housing in particular, but also uh, community stewardship of land. And um, at the same time, that picture of the homeless partnered with allies from Nicely and dived into this deep participatory action research project, um, which was looking at, all right, we know that there's all this vacant land. What do we do about it? How does this um, fit into our um, effort to create a housing landscape that's based on housing as a human right? And in that research process, um, identified community land trusts as a tool for leveraging vacant properties to create actual housing for folks who are experiencing homelessness. So through that research project and uh, coming to CLTs, a uh, picture, excuse me, uh, East Carolina Barrio CLT was developed in 2014 as a pilot project of NICELY um, and intended to really examine and put into practice um, community land trusts in New York City, which would only be the second time that had been done on, on, a, uh, on a larger scale, let's say, um, in New York City history after Cooper Square, which is one of the more well-known uh, CLTs in the country. And so after, you know, putting pressure on the city through the report and just the scalding, the call out of the city's responsibility in creating some of these terrible conditions, especially in city owned buildings, uh, picture the homeless organizers who, who were staffing East um, Barrio CLT at the time, put a lot of work into uh, bringing the city on board with the CLT model. And so, like I mentioned, that was everything from um, education events for elected officials, um, the walking tour that the um, organizers did with city agents um, to really call attention to conditions in real time, to see them personally, uh, but also deep outreach and base building in East Harlem itself, right? Because the idea wasn't just that the city needs to be put onto the CLT model, residents and community members need to be put onto that as well. And so that was everything like a community forum and one of the larger affordable housing developments in East Harlem, um, which invited uh, hundreds of community members to learn about the CLT model, um, to learn how um, they might participate and engage in building out that sort of infrastructure in East Harlem and the surrounding areas. And then building out, and then the deep, the door knocking, as every organizers know, that's the heart of our work of getting, building personal relationships with residents in the neighborhood, um, giving information that would help make clear a little bit what the CLT model was more generally, but specifically, what does it mean to them? Um, and so it was a combination of bringing the, the organizing that was done with community residents. You have some pictures here. Um, of some of the forums that happened, um, some of the um, community meetings that were going on 
um, that brought that identified some of the uh, city owned buildings where residents were more interested in the CLT model. Um, which is where PTH began to focus a lot of its, its efforts in identifying community leaders. Um, and then, of, of course, moving the city forward with the project. And as I mentioned uh, earlier on the panel, that is, um, it was that combination of organizing um, with the, within the community and then putting pressure on the city that where, uh, where Eastern Arbadio identified the four buildings that are currently in the project. So here you have the buildings that are in the project. Um, I won't go into details into them now, but they are concentrated in East Harlem with one building that's also in Central Harlem. Um, for currently, there are a total of 36 residential units and three commercial and community spaces. Um, and after the rehab process um, is completed, there will actually be 38 residential units. So I wanted to give a sense of who's involved in the project, um, who uh, keeps things moving along. So we have East Harlem Barrio um, CLT Board of Directors, which is made up of a combination of um, East Harlem and Barrio residents, um, folks who are engaged in um, local organizing, some folks who have some expertise in um, community-based financing, um, specifically of um, some forms of HDFCs, which is a form of um, ownership created, uh, a structure of ownership that the city kind of leans, leans heavily on and then you have some of our technical service providers, including Take Root Justice, which was a key um, legal, uh, they're a legal practitioner that really supported us in fleshing out the legal framework for our model. Um, our elected official who was particularly um, supportive of our model, and then of course our lenders. And I won't go too deep into the financing structure because that's its own story. But I did want to go a little bit um, into our process and I'm going, I'm a little behind time. So maybe I won't do this, um, but a little bit into our governance actually, um, because that's pretty key. We decided uh, early on um, to partner with uh, nonprofit developers, Banana Kelly and Catch, who will both support in doing the rehab process for the buildings in the project, given that they're all in various stage, stages of deterioration, three of which needing gut rehabs, um, and who will also support with the management of the buildings while the buildings are under rehab. And so the question here, um, so what we're trying to break out here is how does the governance work in this sort of situation where you have these developers who bring such expertise um, and kind of professionalism to the idea of community stewardship. And this is a breakdown of the, the model and the ownership structure, um, especially calling attention to the mutual housing association that we created, which is a separate entity from the community land trust. The mutual housing association is actually the entity that owns all of the four buildings in the project or will own after the construction is completed, while the CLT only owns the land. And the idea is to separate ownership of the land and the, uh, the buildings to prevent any single entity from being able to flip it, make a profit, um, and also encourage more widespread, more dispersed um, control and decision-making power over the land and the buildings. Um, he is the um, distribution of um, uh, board seats. You'll see during construction, it's based in uh, the, the nonprofit organization. So the developers and the CLT is kind of stewards while it's in uh, under construction. But then after rehab, the majority of the seats will go to tenants, which is where the tenant control comes from, of course. Now the challenge is, is not everyone is necessarily sold onto the CLT model. How do we bring in, um, folk, how do we build interest and investment in a tenant run governance structure for folks who have been so scouted from their experience as tenants of city owned properties, um, who have never had the opportunity to be in control of their housing, um, and who also maybe don't really believe that it's possible based off of not just their own experiences, but as I mentioned earlier, of the experiences of their parents of their other family members. Um, and so we're in the process now of doing trainings during this rehab period that will segue from the nonprofit organizations holding leadership and governance of the project to tenants. Um, so here's some just lessons learned from the project since I'm running uh, low on the time is that while we got these properties from the city very cheaply, um, it, it didn't mean that it came without other expenses. Like I mentioned, 
poor conditions of the buildings um, mean a significant rehab cost. And that's putting us into debt with the city and a private lender, which forces us to make compromises on some of the terms of the deal, which also means we don't have full control of the properties. So how do we leverage um, maybe accessible properties like city owned properties where the city has more control to say, okay, we're gonna give this property to you without forcing you to pay it, but recognizing the other maybe hidden costs that might be involved in that transaction. Um, and then of course, how do we push the city on recognizing what tenant control really means? Um, they may think that it's just a question of just putting tenants on a board, but that assumes that tenants are prepared to be on a board, have experience with it. That also assumes that the board is a be all and end all of tenant control or community stewardship, right? That's just one governance structure that has its limits as well. And so how do we continue to push the city to recognize other forms and other elements of collective stewardship and, and specifically tenant control of property? Um, and then, of course, this means how are we building relationships between tenants and community members to define for themselves what collective and, uh, ownership and stewardship means um, in the context of some of these difficulties in the city, uh, in getting the city on board with the structure, as well as um, and the ongoing costs related to managing uh, properties. So I'll end there. I'm sure I left maybe more questions than answers, but looking forward to be in conversation with folks. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about fighting for land, but before I do, I need to just start with, um, and tell you a little bit about the organization and then move into the land conversation. Um, so I work, oops. Um, so I work for an organization that's been around for about 35 years. It's known as a Women's Community Revitalization Project, but that's too long, so we call it WCRP. It has a two-part mission. So for 35 years, we've had the same two-part mission. Half of the mission is building buildings. And for us, that's been mostly homes, although we've built childcare centers and healthcare centers and some office buildings for nonprofits. And the second equally important half of the mission is building leadership. And that's folks who are experiencing the issue telling their stories, knowing the data, knowing they're not alone, and pushing elected officials to do the right thing and to pass legislation that works. Um, we've built more than 300 houses. I have a lot of slides. I'm going to do them real quick, and I talk quick, too. So if anyone has questions, that's fine. We provide support for our tenants. Our initial tenants earn less than uh, $12,000 a year. Once people get homes, they can do amazing stuff and move forward in many areas, including getting more money. And then of course, organizing to build power and win strong policies and new resources. This is a map of Philly in the right. You see Philadelphia, that little orange square was the neighborhood where we started. It's in North Philly, East Abroad. And everyone who lives or works or worships in a neighborhood knows a lot about that community. And folks in our community were really worried because there was so much vacant land and buildings. But it wasn't until we mapped it, every single piece of gray is a vacant lot. And every black thing on that map is vacant building. One out of every four addresses was vacancy. And one quarter of that vacancy was owned by the government. And so that was something that was going on in our neighborhood around 13 years ago, right before we started our CLT when we mapped it. And the same thing that was happened at the same time as we had a lot of vacancy, we had market pressures. So here you see some slides, like people are starting to get interested in our neighborhood who aren't from the neighborhood. They knocked down buildings, they built something, fanciness, student housing, high-end housing. So in communities where you have both a lot, oops, a lot of vacant land and market pressure, we heard about this thing called the Community Land Trust. It was organizations in the neighborhood. So we went around and talked to our friends and relations, people from church, home and school, mosque. People talked to people about how does vacant land affecting you and your family? How is this market pressure and higher costs affecting you? And we started to talk about community land trusts and this is how we presented them. The, there's this publicly, there's vacant land and it could be transferred to a community organization that um, would put it back to use. If you hear something meowing, it's my cat. I think she really likes CLTs. And so when you talk to folks and ask them questions, you got to report back. And so there was a, a, a set of report back meetings where we talked to folks initially about what they said, what we had in common, and started talking a little bit more about CLTs. 
And at the last meeting that everyone was present, when people finally felt like they had a handle on this, what is this CLT thing? You own the structure, not the land. What is it? People got to put their name tags up on the wall on a continuum. This is a great idea. This is a bad idea. It was at this meeting that we formed the Community Justice Land Trust. Um, our land trust has done a bunch of stuff. You heard a little bit about it. We built some houses. We have, we're trying to put together the money for some more houses. We got in a fight with a local developer and we had to develop five home ownership units right away because he didn't want poor people's cars across from his rich people's houses. But in any event, some of the things we're most proud of are that we work together to, to really talk to folks in general, especially to our funders about community land trusts. And so we got some of our funders, like our State Housing Finance Agency, the Federal Home Loan Bank, and our city's Division of Housing to include in their applications for funding more points for long-term and permanent affordability. And then we developed relationships with groups throughout our city. And there's about 12 organizations that are starting CLTs in Philly and also formed a collaborative with all the CLTs statewide. I just want to talk for a minute before I talk about land, about what's happening citywide, not just in our neighborhood. Here's a slide that's showing you, and it's just data between 2000 and 2016, how housing prices have gone up. And in the neighborhood where we work, they went up more than 350%. The second data point is really people are getting pushed out in these same neighborhoods. There's a lot of real estate transfers in North, South, and West Philly. And look, you see, there are fully a third less African-American households since 2000 in these neighborhoods. So we see the problem. There's a broad coalition that's involved in this problem that cares about both housing and food. And our solution is that vacant land, land owned by the city, buildings owned by the city should be turned over, just like Athena was talking about. They spoke about returning land to community use and community hands. So our current coalition is the Philadelphia Coalition for Affordable Communities. It's 70 groups citywide, faith, labor, disability rights, tiny civic organizations, some bigger organizations, and we're coming together. We put out data about the problem of vacant land in our city, the costs, and what our solution is. And you saw some data about the problem. Both gardens are, being, are at risk of development, People are hungry in our city and folks are getting pushed out. And so our solution is we want our city council to pass legislation that puts this vacant land in community hands. So what we've been doing this summer is every month we've had teach-ins on community control and permanent affordability. And next week at the first day of city council, we're gonna have a rally in front of city hall telling city council now is the time to pass legislation. The end. I'm turning it back over to you, Athena. Thank you so much, Nora. And I see we've got a couple of questions um, in the chat. And so um, one was directed right at you, Nora. So maybe you want to answer that. But while um, maybe while you answer that, we can um, continue to sow to, to sow the seeds for our conversation, which is we encourage we ask folks to um, kind of categorize yourself where you're at in your CLT work right now. And I believe uh, Julia had put in the chat earlier what those categories are. And so folks want to continue to consider where you're at and maybe um, add additional questions in the chat um, that you would help move you along in your process. And could someone help me with a question? Because I was on my slide no and I couldn't problem. see the chat. Thank no you. worries. So the question for you in particular, Nora, was I believe how y'all mapped out um, how you created the map that you had in your presentation. We took every one of us, and there were a whole group of organizations together, got colored pencils, and we walked the neighborhood and mapped where we saw vacant properties and vacant buildings. And then we compared it to the city, and the city did not have much data on who owned those, because we really wanted to see what was city owned, because we know the city, in fact, our city owns 6,000 parcels of land and 5,000 our surplus right today, and this was 13 years ago. So we just went out and did it. And then we were able to show a funder that we went out and did this and we got some preliminary planning money and they helped us get consultants. And then we did fancy maps, but we did our first maps with our own colored pencils, going out with clipboards and maps and just mapping blocks. People took different blocks. People knew where the vacancy was in their neighborhood. 
Yeah, I would say that that actually is reflective of, of a lot of the work that Picture the Homeless did and, you know, before East Carolina Barrio became its own organization was a massive community effort of folks just participating block by block, looking at where the vacant properties are and comparing that to city data. Um, and so to actually to um, the question um, of uh, Robert, how to acquire publicly owned land and then Later, Lauren, you would also ask how to get the housing agency officials to warm up to the idea of CLTs. It was actually in, in East Carolina Barrios context, it was the report that PTH created, Banking on Vacancy, that really became a rallying cry for community organizations um, using that data of like, wow, there really is an incredible amount of vacant property in the city. It's entirely irresponsible of the city to leave them languishing while we have the skyrocketing, ever increasing homelessness population. That needs that those properties need to be put to the use of housing folks who are houseless, um, and so it was both that that public kind of um, calling out of the city um, through the report to say y'all created this these conditions you need to fix it, and then the ongoing re, uh, organizing after it, which was um, getting city officials onto that walking tour so they could see it, it, it personally um, the the incredible damage and, and deterioration that um, residents of city-owned properties had been living in over decades. I'll give you an example. One of the, um, some of the residents of one of our buildings were displaced from their building over 13 years ago because the conditions in the property were so terrible and just unlivable. And 13 years later, they're still not back in their building, even though at the time the city had promised to make the repairs of, on their building and get them back into their homes. And so the city makes all these commitments um, or did make all these commitments to um, not just improve uh, conditions in the properties that the city owned, but also to set community members on a pathway to ownership. These are commitments that the city didn't fulfill. And it was in calling out that kind of hypocrisy, for lack of a better word, that put um, a lot of pressure onto CLTs that I believe turned the, uh, put the pressure on the city that turned the tides um, in terms of the city um, being willing to explore a CLTs for, um, uh, as, a, as an option for organizing around affordable housing. Athena. Yes. So you didn't mention housing, not warehousing legislation. I did not. You're, that's a good, very good point. You did a lot of work on that, remember? Yeah, would you like to speak to it? Well, I can speak to some of it, but I think Please. I think it was important for us to have the ability to hold landlords accountable for sitting for sitting on vacant properties across the city. You know, we did and you know also when you're you know, we had students from uh, Fordham University that helped do the building counts. Uh, we had different allies and other people that would help, that helped us to do, uh, to write uh, these reports. And also, you know, going to the city council and, you know, taking over their offices and telling them, look, this is, you need to pass this, right? You know, you need to pass this. You need to do something about this. You know, um, you know, and um, I think that, you know, the whole thing about housing, not warehousing is very important to look at how governments fund landlords to keep people in poverty. And that's something that, that we need to work on and we need to continue to work on. Slumlords and all that stuff ties in together with that. But I just wanted to, to, to just remind folks about the piece of legislation that people that that landlords were like, that'll never pass. <laughs> you know, I had this guy that was the head of Volunteers of America. He was the president and CEO. He goes, they will never do that. I had a meeting with him one time and I explained to him that, look, we needed to have something to hold landlords accountable for sitting on vacant property. Like, you know, some of these buildings have been standing for 30 years. So anyway, I just wanted to remind you of that. I think what you're speaking to is about people power. And that's how in some cases and many cases is the only way to acquire land. 
And very often we have the strongest people power at election time. So I just want to say we got the land because the elected official that gave it to our coalition, his opponent was, he was an African-American guy from the neighborhood. His opponent was a white developer and he wanted to win the election. So he wanted to look good and he was a good guy. And so he gave our coalition the land and he was able to speak to that in forums. So I think this is about who can give you what you want and what power do you have over them and a power analysis of how to figure out how to build your people power and get people to be on your side. I mean, they may start out as your targets and be your allies. I mean, once you win. <laughs> um, looking at some of the responses, it looks like folks are in a wide range of um, or on the spectrum of CLT work. So I would encourage folks to continue to, um, if you're in the don't quite fit any of the categories, if you're willing to share a little tidbit in the chat about where you are at in your process and how you would describe your work currently, or especially any uh, questions that you may have um, related that might help us um, support or speak to some of your work currently. Um, and while folks are hopefully typing in the chat, uh, I'll add that I think part of what came through, and, and Anthony, thank you so much for that crucial addition, is um, framing the framework of accountability, I think, can be a really powerful tool when moving the city. Um, and it, I think that comes from, first and foremost, calling out the harm that any landlord um, has owned. But I think it's particularly effective for the city. I don't know if it's as effective with private landlords, but maybe, Nora, I don't know if you um, if y'all had any experience in trying to move private landlords in particular. But it seems at, at, in the context of New York City, in particular, the city's housing and preservation department, um, calling them out, they're very sensitive to any media that called out their role in causing harm and kind of the violence of, of city policy on black and brown working class communities. Um, and that was, I think, one of that was one of the crucial, more most crucial elements that mobilized the city to towards the city, the CLT structure is being forced to reckon with some of the harm that they had caused. Um, I don't know if that speaks to your experience, Elnor. Yeah, I mean, we're in our work. We know that people need to tell their stories because their stories are the most powerful. But those stories have to be connected up with data to show that they're not alone, and especially in understanding what their connection is to an official that has some power over making some change or voting for a piece of legislation. If you have a good politician, again, I don't have that much experience working in the private sector to make them do stuff, it's hard, but we can pass legislation that will make them do stuff. Right now in Philly, there is land disposition that makes it easy for market rate developers to get city owned land, but there's no land disposition that makes it easy for us to get land. So we're gonna take that land away from market rate developers by passing a law that makes gives us first priority. So the analysis that happens for this is happening to us, and this is the pain that it's causing our city in terms of the cost, and this is our solution. And working together with a champion that understands you, an elected official that is on, cares about this stuff to craft legislation. And that means learning like, a lot about legislation, the difference between may and shall in a piece of legislation. So it just feels like a lot of folks in this group may already be doing this. Is there an example of anyone in the group that currently has a piece of land and is figuring out what to do next? Or any other questions? I would say, this is Anthony, I would say that it's important that the people that are most affected in these communities, not just in Philly, but across the country, you have leaders, you have poor people that are experiencing poverty, being poor, being homeless, right? And when you bring these folks together on an issue that's affecting them in that community, then that's how you, like when we were going out counting these buildings, people are like, who are you when? What are you doing? And, and, <laughs> and, you know, the community was like, it was about time somebody came around and uh, did something, right? You know, and, and, you know, this is ideas that came from homeless people. You know, why do we have all these empty buildings? Like, we got all these homeless people and all these, and now you got homeless people in shelters 
at a cost of $3,000 a month. New York City has a billion dollar budget for homeless services. You know, and it's like, what is wrong with these pictures? What is wrong with homelessness and capital, right? And like, we need to get, so when we are working with people on the lowest level in our communities and understanding the disinvestment, like Baltimore, we have the highest murder rate in the country. Why? Because of disinvestment. That's why. That's all I wanted to say. I don't want to get into my uh, my third person, as Lynn said, comes out. So I better I put my uh, third person away. <laughs> no, this is so valuable. I think there was a question about workers' rights as well as affordable housing. And there are many folks that try to divide us as folks who care about deeply affordable housing and say the problem is that we can't create deeply affordable housing because the construction workers are making too much money or those construction workers don't hire us, which may, very often is true. But I think the, the fact is that folks who do construction work live in our communities, they need decent wages, they need health and welfare, and those folks are our folks. And in our coalition, there are many low wage unions that are part of our coalition, including the laborers. And we make very clear that the work we do needs to be decent wages. Any buildings we create need to create jobs that are decent wages. We can't separate these issues out because the reason people can't afford housing is because they don't have enough money. So I really appreciate raising up the idea of labor and affordable housing. Um, could I ask a question? Please. Um, I don't know if you have a raised hand function. Anyway, um, I'm in San Francisco, and um, I'm concerned about, uh, like, uh, my, like we have, a, there's a lot of money, I guess, here that goes to supposedly low-income housing, and I'm in one of them, but I mean, the, the executive director of my uh, landlord makes over 300000 a year. The head of the homeless department, which is fairly new since 2016, he cost us almost a million dollars in three years. So the um, excessive executive compensation of the city departments and their preferred nonprofits is, uh, you know, criminal. And we have um, thousands of people unhoused. And then the, the, the city out contracts these things. So they pay their friends hundreds of thousands, but the workers do not get paid a livable wage. I knew somebody was spending 350 a week a month on this commute. Um, so, uh, and also my property manager. Oh my gosh. I mean, she's created such a hostile work, work, I mean, a living space. It's controlled by dogs, literally. And we don't have trees and grass. And, um, and the desk clerks can play hate music in my lobby. I'm locked out. I can't get in. Seven years. They're getting paid $2,500 for my unit. Um, so, um, I mean, it's a very nice place. The architects did a nice job. but uh, um, And then they hired these radicals to make them look good. But the radicals don't, don't fight my landlord. They fight they or the government or the feds or anybody but my landlord. And uh, anyway, so what can be done about... Um, you know, some serious monitoring of not just the buildings, which might be nice, but how, you know, the tenants are treated by property management. Um, I mean, I'm fighting them, but it's David and Goliath. And it's, is your name Miss Denise? Uh, Denise in, yeah. Jacques, in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, maybe I can start and then hand it over to you, Athena, and anyone else can add. But I think the first thing we look for in anyone who wants to take on some of the things that you're talking about, Ms. Denise, is anger and agitation. And I can hear it, you have it. And I feel like it's a really exciting moment, I think for me when I get really angry at something because I'm ready to take the next step. And it sounds like you're already taking the next step, which well, is I mean, I've, I've been, I'm, I've been. You can go oh. or I could go, I don't care which. Might've cut out. Oh, so I'll go. So the next step is doing your homework and getting data. But again, what I want to say when you're involved. Writer, in the... I'm a document keeper. I, they've done criminal behavior, extortion. They've been in my U.S. mailbox. I've carried. Miss Denise, mailbox. I'm giving you a compliment about that. I really <laughs> appreciate it. And, you know, I'm not so good at keeping the data, but we need folks in our, in our leadership team that are keeping the data. 
there is a power analysis that is done when we're deciding on a campaign goal that has to do with what is our goal and identifying pretty clearly what do we want to change and what power do we have over someone who can give us what we want and what power do we have over them? So I would, I think that that's some of the steps that you're coming to. Do you want to say anything about this, Athena? Yeah, I actually think this speaks to um, Cindy Torres' comment in the chat about the city um, always choosing to go with familiar developers instead of, um, you know, community groups um, that are focused in organizing around afford affordable housing is that there's a lot of data out there demonstrating just how inefficient cities actually are in running their own affordable housing problems or, or programs or other social housing, right? Like just looking at, for example, in New York City and the terrible conditions of um, NYCHA or our um, city's housing authority um, requiring apparently billions of dollars to do the repairs that need to be made while this was all under city governance, right? And so um, similar to what we talked about, I talked about earlier on the power of the um, report that picture the homeless uh, ish created an issue, the data to reflect the inefficiencies or even, even more um, uh, critically the, the damage done and the violence inflicted through direct, directly through city policy can be a really powerful tool for organizing and pointing towards alternate models that will have a greater impact towards our goals for affordable housing than what the city has already put into place. And it sounds like you already have some of that data. Um, but for Cindy, I wonder if that might also be- Cindy is the one putting my housing in jeopardy. That's, That's right. I think we're- Cindy pressure me to see segregated I call senior housing in a pandemic. Denise, and I'm so sorry the connection is a bit poor. And now my box is in the old place, so they say I have two places. Um <laughs> and uh now that you're adding my head to all two subsidy so, Ms. Denise, I'm going to interrupt you, you for a minute a because we're, gonna, we're, we're just about to close off this breakout session. So we really appreciate what you're saying. We're with you and support your work. But before we end, maybe we end it. <laughs> I think we might have ended. OK, no, think, thanks. <laughs> stay strong and pay close attention. <laughs> yes. That's right. Stay strong and pay close attention. All right. Uh, yeah, I think all the groups have come back into the main room now. Um, so um, first of all, I want to thank you all. Um, and even just looking at the numbers, I'm just so happy that like folks stuck around. There's <laughs> still um, folks are stuck to the small groups and are coming back. Um, so um, we'll just um, move to uh, just some, some closing. Um, First and foremost, um, I know that uh, Partners for Dignity Rights and some of the um, organizing organizations of the original Affordability for Whom and also of this conversation um, are also wondering if this is um, an important sort of uh, space to continue and whether uh, we moving forward in the future convene maybe deeper dive conversations into each of these issues uh, moving forward. Um, and so if you registered for this conference, which I think, or for this summit, everyone who uh, you know, has in attendance, I'm sure registered, um, you'll probably be receiving an email in the next um, you know, week or two, uh, I think coming from Partners for Dignity and Rights, asking some questions, kind of a survey, uh, you know, one obviously evaluating this event, but also asking some questions about if we continue to sort of host a space to talk about various aspects of deeply affordable community, uh, uh, affordable housing vis-a-vis uh, -a, -vis a community land trust model. Um, are you interested in that? Uh, and would you be interested in uh, also naming what specific conversations 
you know, it could be any of the three breakouts or we spend more time uh, going more in depth. And then so folks, if you were sort of torn between groups to go in between, we may then come back and do, you know, sort of focused conversations in each of those three areas or some other ones that you may name. So I just wanted to say, um, be on the lookout uh, in the next uh, week or two for a survey from partners, um, you know, evaluating this particular event and then asking, you know, would you want to participate in future uh, conversations about community land trust and, uh, and to also ask uh, and what, what kinds of conversations or su subject areas uh, folks are interested. Um, I don't have uh, more to say. I think maybe I should turn it over to uh, perhaps to Peter, um, if there's any other closing uh, thoughts or if you want to open it up for Q&A or some other pieces uh, before we adjourn for the evening. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Kenyon. Um, I, I, there, I guess there's one last thing I want to say about the report um, and then, then we can open it up. Um, that the, what we try to do in this report is, is um, show essentially that the, the community controlled housing um, is not simply an end, um, but it's also the means um, really to, to bring more public support into the arena. We have the opportunity um, just by virtue of the organizing that we do um, to, to, to advance um, public policies and to mobilize. Um, but it, it seems that we have that opportunity if we don't get dragged down the rabbit hole of development. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't understand it. We need to learn it enough to respect it and work with the tools available. Um, and that's what we, we give you in this report, I think. Um, but also um, to create new tools and, um, and basically to, 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 to work with those um, who have um, that deep expertise, learn from them, um, and bring um, community controlled housing to as many people as possible. So I just wanted to make that point um, about the report. Um, I would, we have five more minutes left. Um, I think I'm, I'm interested to hear what went on in, in other groups, Hillary, Julia. Um, I can say in the hotel conversion group, Michael gave an outstanding presentation um, by PowerPoint on uh, the, the various hotel conversions that uh, have been done in Vermont and really went into depth on that. And I'm going to ask him to share that PowerPoint um, with me and I will um, also share it with all the, uh, the, the registrants as well. Um, but uh, Julia, Hillary, report backs from your groups. The um, City on Land group, Nora and Athena, both give really great presentations on how they organize to get lands. And the key takeaway is the importance of building people power, doing that power analysis, um, identifying who you can move, um, and also just the need that um, even free, like free property isn't enough, essentially. Um, we need to organize for capital funds and for ongoing operating subsidy. Um, and a lot of that's gonna come through, again, people power and um, coalition organizing. So that's what we talked about. Uh, and our group was focused on tenant organizing and creative financing. Steve King from the Oak CLT spoke about a range of different property types that they are working with uh, and uh, a little bit about the creative financing strategies. There were a lot of really good questions about some of the nitty gritty and, um, and some great answers that came from Steve and also thoughts from Lydia in uh, the Chinatown CLT in Boston uh, and some, some other input out of New York. Um, and, you know, it all kind of came back to the organizing that like the, there isn't really a generalizable formula here. Um, that, you know, the challenges are really context specific and the only way through them is to build a base that organizes and pushes. Um, and so 
there was a lot of discussion, a little bit more actually discussion about the some of the nuances of that. And we learned that Oak CLT partners with um, a base building tenant organizing organization called ACE. Uh, and so Oak CLT has hired two staff organizers and is building some capacity to do that work and is becoming seen as a resource for tenants who do get organized. Uh, but they're really working in strategic intentional partnership with a tenant organizing group that's separate from the CLT. So that was a really interesting um, kind of insight to hear. So uh, there was a lot more than that, but those were some highlights. Thank you. Closing remarks, Kenyon, anybody? <laughs> Um, I don't have any other closing remarks, but um, I just wanted to, again, want to thank, um, you know, all the organizers of uh, this summit tonight and, uh, you know, to remind people to check out uh, the Affordable for Home um, report released by Partners for Civilian Rights. Um, and just stay tuned for uh, future conversations and um, which you will um, get an email from partners about in the next couple of weeks. And thank you all for attending. And also to say thank you to our interpretation team for your hard work uh, in making this accessible to uh, Spanish speakers as well. And um, that's all from my vantage point. So enjoy your Tuesday night and uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Thank you. <laughs>